Hello. Hello. Um, good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. My name is Pablo Castro. I am the product manager here at Bloomberg for European and Asia Pac securitization. Uh, we're very proud to uh, be hosting this uh, event today with the ASF. Um, the event also is being uh, recorded, so people can watch it in Australia tomorrow, later. Actually, we're, it's live right now in the Bloomberg website if anyone wanted to spend their Australian hours, uh, evening hours, uh, taking a look. Um, so Bloomberg uh, has been for the past few years and remains uh, very committed to the Australian securitization market. Last year, the Australian securitization market, as all of you know, had a, a very, very successful year. And here at Bloomberg, we've been um, trying our best to help the market and help uh, um, issuers uh, and investors worldwide connect to that market. Um, I don't want to, you know, go on a lot of a lot of stuff, but uh, some of the things that I think are worth mentioning, because not everybody in the room may may know, is um, all the effort that we've done in connection to handling loan-level data, uh, which uh, is something that the RBA, um, that the, the RBA initiative uh, spurred so, so that issuers publish loan-level data, investors have access to that loan-level data. Um, at the time, a few, couple years ago, um, issuers had to balance that need for disclosure and transparency with the needs of um, data protection of consumers. So in the end, um, what, in the, what, what happened was to gain access to the data, you have to sign agreements um, to, you know, to, to, to put a layer of, of, uh, of, of safety on, on the bank's uh, side. So what Bloomberg did was essentially get agreements signed with every uh, issuer out there. So we have essentially now have agreements with all the issuers except for maybe a couple that haven't issued since, you know, before the crisis. So pretty much everyone that is active has an agreement with us. And uh, we handle and then get all that loan level data. We store it. Uh, we get it actually from you know, our friends at Perpetual. And um, we provide you with tools to analyze that data, to use that data, and to query and, and get any answers about it, monitor your portfolios, et cetera. Um, we then use that data also to build our cash flow models. So every new deal that comes out of the Australian securitization market is modeled by Bloomberg. Uh, in advance of pricing, and people can run their, you know, their, their, their stress tests. They can run their simulations, your break evens, and you know, do a lot of even more sophisticated things, such as carving out specific groups of, of loans, etc. Um, another initiative that we've been working on, that you know, has been going on for for a while, but it's worth mentioning, is uh, daily valuations. We provide daily valuations of Australian securitisation across the board um, through our BVAL uh, pricing service. And uh, finally, the other thing I wanted to, to mention is um, one thing that we have been very busy here working at Bloomberg is, is integrating uh, the Barclays portfolio business that Bloomberg bought in 2016 back into the Bloomberg portfolio analytics system. And as a part of that, we have uh, you know, great support of Australian um, RMBS and ABS securities that flow seamlessly through to our portfolio tools. Um, so that's worth, uh, that's worth knowing because in the past, for those that were users of that system, that was not the case. So in Bloomberg, now everything uh, flows, flows directly. So um, if you have any questions, you want to learn more about what we do for the Australian space, uh, there are some handouts, and you know, my colleagues or myself can see there with an orange badge. Uh, we're happy to, to you know, answer any questions. Without further ado, let me you know, uh, introduce the first, the, f the first panel, please. Uh, so it's tapas. Oh, you, uh, please. I'm sorry, do you mind if you? This one. Ah, great. Um, sorry about that. So just a bit of background on myself. Um, a macroeconomist. I've been an economist at NAB for a couple of years now. Moved over to London about six months ago. And today's title, reassuringly boring, I think uh, harks to my experience. So since I've been in the UK, we've had uh, problems in Italy, 
Uh, Spain has a new PM. You've had Donald Trump coming out there wanting tariffs on everything from cars to steel to aluminium. You've got trade wars going on. Going back to Australia, pretty boring really. So Australia, 27 years without recession. The growth outlook is picking up. Um, while the growth outlook is picking up, there's nothing much on the inflation front. So the RBA is on the sidelines pretty much. I think why Australia is reassuringly boring is because of two factors. So one, we've got a pretty stable political environment and that stable political environment is due to compulsory voting, the dominance of the two party system. So you don't tend to get these big shifts in uh, political standing in Australia. So that leads to a bit of stability there. And the second one is obviously Australia went through a big mining boom, a big mining downturn, and now commodity prices are coming back up again. So we're getting a bit of a growth impetus from higher commodity prices, and that is also spreading out towards the wider Australian economy. So you're seeing growth pick up in the big non-mining regions of New South Wales and Victoria, and you're also starting to see that spread out to WA and Queensland. And so that is quite an important development. The third factor that's going on in Australia, we've had very, very strong population growth over the past uh, five years or so. Government infrastructure hasn't really kept up with that population growth. So you're starting to see this big infrastructure backlog and the government is very focused on, on delivering on that infrastructure. So Sydney at the moment only has one major airport. Now that's a travesty considering Sydney is one of the major capital cities of Australia. A, a second airport has, has been approved and will be built over the next 10 years. And there's a whole heap of other infrastructure projects going on at the moment and that will support growth in the economy going forward. With that background, employment growth has been very strong. Wages are slowly picking up and the jobless rate has been gradually falling from around 6% down to 5.6%. Now we think that unemployment rate will keep falling and that will s support the economy overall. Now, while we're here today, we're here to talk about the housing market. So the, the housing market prices have come off the boil a little bit. So prices in Sydney are down by around 4.5%. Prices in Melbourne are down around 1.5% from their peak. But in the whole scope of things, they have really mild declines. Over the past few years, you might have seen a number of headlines to do with the Australian housing market, one being widespread oversupply. Well, yes, there were oversupply concerns around a couple of years ago, but just given how strong population growth has been at the moment, that oversupply is not really coming to fruition. In fact, when you look at rental vacancy rates, they're actually below long run average levels in Melbourne, in Sydney, uh, at long run average in, in Brisbane. And where you thought there might have been oversupply in Perth and Darwin, vacancy rates are actually starting to fall in the past few quarters. So it looks like even in those cities, things are starting to stabilise. Now, we obviously look at all our uh, RMBS portfolios and we realise as well that arrears rates are very low and mortgage buffers are very high. In fact, the RBA looked into these kind of details. They found, on average, the average household has 2.7 years saved as prepayment sitting in mortgage offset accounts. So it looks like loan serviceability is quite high in Australia at the moment. In, in my talks to international investors, one of the things they're, they're picking up is the headlines coming out of the Royal Commission. And there's some fears that credit conditions will tighten on the back of that. Now, yes, that is always a possibility, but credit conditions have already been tightened in Australia ever since around 2014. So we don't think that will add too much more to the tightening in credit conditions so far. But so that's my said piece. But in terms of what is going on in Australia, I think this chart shows you quite nicely. This chart shows you business conditions in Australia by state. Um, New South Wales and Victoria, the two big non-mining states of Australia, very well above average business conditions. WA and Queensland, which have a more mining tilt to them, are also starting to recover, and they're starting to recover on the back of high commodity prices. In fact, when you look at those charts, you can see those levels are actually well above long run average levels for New South Wales and Victoria. So it's saying the business sector is looking quite nice in Australia at the moment. When you split this data up into the different industries, you're seeing um, very strong conditions in the construction sector. And no surprises there. I was saying about the big infrastructure backlog that's in Australia at the moment. Manufacturing conditions are also picking up. And when you ask firms what bits of manufacturing, a lot of it is food manufacturing. So we're exporting a lot of food towards Asia at the moment, a lot of wine, um, a lot of beef in those kind of areas. The one area of weakness in the Australian economy, and I think it's an area of weakness across the globe, is the retail sector. So you look at that blue line up there, and retail 
business conditions, uh, a little bit around, around average levels there. And the key factor there is the growth of online competition, that's crimping sales margins, and you're seeing that in a lot of countries uh, around the world. Just to show you how Australia compares to a number of other countries in the world that we think are strong, um, when you compare business conditions in Australia to Germany and to the US, so I've just got the US ISM and the German IFO up there, we're pretty much tracking with them in terms of how strong our domestic economy is at the moment. So I think that is quite encouraging. As I was saying, we've had 27 years without recession and we think growth in 2018 and 2019 is likely to pick up to around a 3% pace on the back of stronger infrastructure spending. And I guess the Australian growth story is one of the miracles of the developed world over the past 27 years. As you can see on the right hand side there, um, GDP level comparisons shows you Australia has outperformed the rest of the world in terms of growth. The story in Australia is definitely a pick up towards non-mining business investment and a pick up in public sector investment. While mining investment has fallen quite a lot over the past couple of years, that looks like it's starting to bottom out at the moment. And dwelling investment looks like it's peaked, but at the same time, population growth remains very strong in Australia. So it looks like there will still be a lot of construction occurring in the dwelling sector. One of the key things in terms of loan serviceability is job creation. And job creation in Australia is very, very strong at the moment. Trend jobs growth is around, uh, around 20,000. Um, and that we think is enough to put downward pressure on the unemployment rate. So we think the unemployment rate, which is currently at 5.6%, should start falling over the next couple of months. Um, when you look at alternative indicators of employment growth around Australia, they're also all, all picking up as well. So one of the questions out of the NAB business survey is, are you employing more people than you were last month? And when you split that up on a state basis, people in New South Wales and Victoria, those firms are employing more people. Also in Queensland, South Australia and WA, those areas that are more concentrated towards the mining sector. So it tells you employment demand is quite strong in Australia at the moment. An alternative set of data is to look at the number of job ads being posted up. And NAB has an agreement with seek.com.au, which has around 80% of the online job ads in Australia. And that's also showing a massive pickup in online job advertising in Australia as well. In terms of unemployment rates by state, unemployment is tre trending down, but one of the things that has limited the fall in the unemployment rate to date has been the participation rate. So the, so the strength in the labour market is attracting more people uh, coming into the labour force, and you're starting to see participation rates lift uh, for a number of different states. Now, that is a very good encouraging sign, but it also means uh, employment demand is quite strong, and so we think that will put further pressure uh, on the unemployment rate to fall. And indeed, when we look at indicators of the unemployment rate, they all, they're all saying unemployment rate should start, should start to fall and should start to fall quite sharply. So the, the ABS, which is Australia's Statistics Bureau, surveys businesses once a quarter, and they ask how, how many positions do you have vacant? And when you map that with the unemployment rate, which is the left-hand chart, you can see it's pointing towards a sharply lower unemployment rate. In fact, on a statistical kind of basis, it's suggesting the unemployment rate should be below 5% and should be almost at 4% based on those historical relationships. Now, of course, those relationships take time to develop, and over time they sh shift around. But the important thing is it's saying the unemployment rate is likely to head lower and is likely to head quite sharply lower over the next year or so. An alternative indicator of the unemployment rate is to ask consumers about how confident are you about being employed? Uh, what, what do you think about your chances of being unemployed? So that's what the right-hand chart is showing. And that is also showing less people are thinking they're going to be unemployed in 12 months' time. And that historically is correlated with the unemployment rate as well. So all those kind of indicators suggest the unemployment rate in Australia should start to fall, should start to fall quite sharply over the next year. In line with that, when you ask firms how difficult it is to find suitable labour, they're all saying the total difficulty in finding labour is starting to rise. In fact, around the highest level since 2008, and that was during the peak of the mining boom. So it's basically saying employers are finding it more difficult to find skilled labour, and as they're finding it more difficult to find skilled labour, it's likely that they'll start to pay their employees more, or alternatively, to start to train more employees. And that's what we're starting to see as well. So wage growth at the moment in Australia is pretty lacklustre. It's growing by around 2% a year. Uh, and really, um, 
In terms of the outlook for the RBA, they really want to see wages growth closer to that 3 to 4% level. Now, there are some encouraging signs. As I was saying, we have a, an agreement with seek.com.au, and, and behind every job ad, we can see the salary payment. And what, what we're seeing is the average advertised salary starting to rise. So when you look at the left-hand chart, average advertised salaries in WA are growing by around 3.8%. Now that's quite a significant development. When you consider during the peak of the mining bust, they're actually falling by 10%. Now, obviously there's a lot of compositional effects going through, but, it, but the important point is it looks like wages are, are trending up. And it looks like the indicators are suggesting the new jobs that are out there are showing stronger wages growth in the existing stock. So we think over the next 12 months or so, wages growth will also pick up in Australia. The other development that's going on is on the back of high commodity prices, the government budget is looking a lot better. So the government just recently released its 2018-2019 uh, budget and they pulled forward the date for the first surplus to 2019-2020. In fact, I was reading the paper the other day, an article by Christopher Joy, uh, and he was saying that on current budget revenues, it's possible that that could even be brought even further forward. So it looks like this pickup in the economy to date is generating a lot of tax revenue. So in terms of the RBA, in terms of loan serviceability, it looks like while it looks like the positive activity indicators are all heading in the right direction, the inflation indicators are not picking up yet. So with that kind of outlook, it's a pretty benign outlook. And to be frank, it's pretty boring if you're a rate strategist in Australia at the moment. Um, it's basically seeing the RBA being on hold for, for probably about a year while they wait until the unemployment rate heads more down towards that 5% level and while they wait for wages to, to pick up. And to reinforce that point, Governor Lowe, I've just got a little bullet point there, said wages growth is a key element in achieving the midpoint of the inflation target, which is obviously 2.5% on a sustained basis. So until you see wages growth lift up to that 3 to 4% level, it's currently around 2.1%, uh, then you're uh, unlikely to see much from the RBA at the moment. So it looks like it's a pretty benign outlook for the next year in terms of monetary policy for Australia. Just underlying that, you can obviously see uh, the RBA's inflation forecasts. They're not really back towards the midpoint of the band within their own forecast horizon. So it looks like a very benign inflation outlook at the moment. In terms of the RBA uh, pricing, markets aren't really pricing much from the RBA until mid next year. And even then, it's only a very gradual uh, rate hike cycle. So enough about the macro backdrop. Now, to move to the housing market. So what we saw over the past four years was a very strong ramp up in price growth in Australia's major capital cities. And what we're starting to see is that to flatten out and it's actually starting to decline in some cities. Now it's not all one story. So while prices have come off in Sydney and maybe a little bit in Melbourne, they're actually rising very sharply in Hobart. So the reason why is because there's a lot of demand from from baby boomers moving back towards Tasmania. So they're obviously demanding property. And there's also a massive leap in tourism numbers to Hobart, which is also leading to competition uh, within the kind of tourism market uh, against the domestic market. So factors like Air, um, Airbnb and, and those kind of things. So that's leading to those price pressures in Hobart. So it's not all one story in Australia at the moment. Um, in Darwin and Perth, which are more mining dominated, um, those prices have been steadily moderating for the next, uh, for the past few years or so, but no alarming falls. So I think that's the key point there. Where there were pretty sharp falls was obviously in the small mining towns. So obviously places like Port Headland, which was just basically an iron ore town, or Caratha, you saw very sharp price falls. Now what you're starting to see now is actually those things starting to level out. So if you look at the last few, few observations, they're actually starting to tick a little bit higher. Now we don't think prices there will dramatically increase, but it's also a sign that the mining downturn is pretty much done and it looks like things are becoming a little bit more stable there now. One factor that's driving dwelling demand at the moment is population growth. So Australia's population is growing by around 400,000 people a year. That's equivalent to population growth of around 1.6% a year. So very, very strong. A lot of that is driven by net migration, which is growing by around 250,000 a year. Just to put that into perspective, when you look over the past 10 years, Melbourne's population, which is a major capital city in Australia, has grown by 25% over the past 10 years. So a million people have been added to, 
one city in, in Australia. In Sydney, Sydney's population has grown by around 20% over the past 10 years. So it's about a, uh, three quarters of a million people. So dwelling demand is quite strong in these cities. It's no surprise why over the past four years or so, you saw price growth accelerate quite sharply in those two capital cities. It's only now that you're actually starting to get the response in dwelling supply. Um, so when you look at dwelling supply, here I've just shown it as dwelling approvals and dwelling completions, they're just basically ticking along with the increase in population. So if you look at the blue line down the bottom, that's just the ratio of new people who are in Australia to the ratio of new dwellings being approved. And that's running at around 1.4 persons. So 1.4 new people per dwelling approved. And that's pretty much its long run average. So to me, that tells me there's very strong underlying demand for dwellings and the current pace of dwelling growth is not really out of kilter with historical averages. So I don't see widespread oversupply concerns in Australia. Sure, there may be pockets in certain inner city areas uh, and those areas may take time to digest. But overall for Australia, it looks like dwelling supply is keeping up with dwelling, dwelling demand. And where dwelling supply is obviously picking up the most is in those areas which have experienced the strongest population growth. So in New South Wales and Victoria, primarily in Melbourne and in Sydney. So that's where population growth is strongest. That's where dwelling supply is coming online. In Queensland, also very strong population growth in the southeast corridor there around the Gold Coast and around Brisbane. Backing up that kind of thesis is when you look at rental vacancy rates, they're actually below or at long on average levels. So you look at Melbourne there on the left-hand side in the red line, the rental vacancy rate in Melbourne is currently around 2.2%. So that's really, really low relative to where it's been over its longer and average levels. In Sydney, it's around at longer and average levels. And in Canberra, Hobart and Adelaide, it's sharply below longer and average levels. Now that's quite astounding. And it probably suggests maybe dwelling supply in Adelaide, Canberra and Hobart is a little bit un undersupplied rather than being oversupplied there at the moment. When you look at rental vacancy rates in Darwin, Perth and Brisbane, they're a little bit elevated, uh, as, especially in Darwin and Perth. Now, no surprises there. Obviously, you had a big mining bust, uh, and that's just starting to turn around now. But importantly, when you look at the last few observations, it's actually starting to tick back down. So it looks like things are starting to recover in the Perth and Darwin area. And just before I left Australia, I was having um, a, a few conversations with a few investors in the commercial space and so more in that kind of area, and they're actually looking to pick the bottom of that market and looking to kind of invest in that at, at the bottom. So I think there's more investors in that kind of space who are thinking around that. Um, obviously, with dwelling supply starting to pick up in line with population growth, you're starting to see residential rents starting to moderate a bit. Um, but even there, you're actually starting to see a little bit of a turnaround occurring in Darwin and Perth. Now, in terms of loan serviceability, mortgage arrears are really at or below long on average levels in most states. So when you look at New South Wales there, uh, this is just the S&P uh, 30 uh, day arrears. Um, they're running at about 0.88% uh, and that's well below its long on average levels. The same thing in um, a number of other areas as well. Um, they have ticked up in the last month, but that was more due to a, um, a, re a reclassification within the actual data itself. And so the overwhelming story is securitized arrears are running well below long and average levels. In WA, Queensland, in Northern Territory, they're obviously running above long and average levels, but even there, they seem to be moderating out a little bit. So they're no longer uh, rising sharply. It looks like they have um, peaked there as well. And in Queensland, they're starting to drift down ever so slightly. So I think they're quite important developments and tells you that in the um, in the loan serviceability space, it looks like households are meeting their loan repayments quite, quite comfortably. Un underlying that, <clears throat> when you look at um, household debt and you actually take into account household deposits, so when you look at net household debt, that's been relatively constant over the past decade. And that's a quite an important development. It also tells you that households are quite conscious of the debt stock they have. So when you look at the uh, chart on the left-hand side, that red line, um, um, household debt as a share of income is at about 188%, but household deposits are running at about 85%. And when you take the net, 
it's about 103%. And that's been flat ever since about 2005. The RBA also looked into this a little bit more and they found on average, uh, the average household has around uh, 2.7 years worth of savings or prepayments saved up in offset and redraw accounts. So for that rainy day, it looks like Australians have saved quite a bit. And in fact, when you break this down by the distribution, around 30% of loans have more than 24 months worth of uh, prepayments saved up. Uh, and 50% have more than six months worth of prepayments saved up as well. So to me, this tells you, yes, Australia may be vulnerable to international shocks, such as with China and those kind of things, but also uh, Australians are quite savvy in the sense they do have quite a lot of savings uh, saved up to service those kind of things in the event of those shocks. So a little bit different to the story that's classically been told. And in fact, when you take it as a share of all loans outstanding, those prepayments sitting in those mortgage offset accounts and redraw accounts is around 18% of that stock. So quite a lot has been saved there. In terms of the um, current Royal Commission into uh, the financial sector, um, I think it's quite important to recognise that lending standards in Australia were already tightened up and were tightened up from about the end of 2014. So um, I've just put a chart up here. These were the two main quantitative prudential measures that were put in place in late 2014 and in 2017. And one of them was a cap on investor credit growth. That cap is now going to come off come, come July, but, in, but the cap was put on so banks couldn't grow their investor loan book by more than 10% a year. And it, uh, consequently, investor cre credit growth has, has slowed quite sharply and is actually running well below that cap. So it looks like uh, measures were tightened up quite a lot. And the same thing with the in interest only share of new loan approvals. So they were running above 30%, then a cap was introduced, now, they're now running around 15%. So the tightening in credit conditions looks like it has already largely occurred. In terms of loan demand at the moment, um, obviously with those caps being put in place and tightening up on the investor side, you've, you've seen the demand from investor finance fall. And so you've seen investor finance approvals as a dollar amount a lot lower than it had been. Consequently, you've seen owner-occupier financing going up. So there's this change in the composition of the demand for financing more towards the own occupy space and away from the investor space. In terms of what people see the housing market to be over the next 12 months, I've just put a few charts up here from NAB's uh, quarterly residential property survey and they, and they also illustrate this theme. So they're seeing more demand coming from own occupiers, more demand coming from first home buyers and less demand coming from foreign buyers. And that's pretty much seen across all the existing and the new property types. Foreign, the foreign investor participation in the Australian housing market still remains relatively strong at around 10% for new property and around 5% for existing property, um, but it has come off its peaks or, or, that were around in 2015. So it seems like you know, foreign investors are, are still um, demanding Australian, Australian property, but their level of activity has come back down. Um, and then in terms of risks to my thesis of reassuringly boring, I guess one of the major ones is household income growth. So um, Australian wages obviously only growing by around 2.1% a year, but consumption growth has been a lot stronger. And so there's been this wedge opening up between consumption growth and income growth. And that's led to a rundown in household savings. Now, as I was saying, over the past few quarters, it looks like the indicators for wages growth are picking up. When you look at average advertised salaries, they're growing quite strongly at the moment. So we do think wage income will, will pick up and we think the consumption will also be supported. Uh, but in terms of risks, if you're looking for a risk, then this is one of the risks out there for the Australian economy at the moment, given consumption is around 60% of the Australian economy. One other risk is obviously international financing, uh, financing conditions that stay elevated. So we we'll all know this story about the blowout in the LIBOR oyster spread. Um, that's obviously carried over to Australia at the moment. It looks like it, it's starting to ease, um, but obviously uh, spreads do remain um, elevated at the moment. And the third and final risk to the Australian economy is China, and it's always a, a, a risk, and it's been a persistent risk for the past 10 years. 
Fortunately, the Chinese authorities have been quite, um, quite good at managing their economy and have been growing their, um, their economy quite, quite nicely. Um, but some indicators do suggest maybe growth is starting to ease a little bit. So when you look at monetary conditions and alternative activity indicators, it looks like growth has moderated uh, slightly. Never, nevertheless, Chinese GDP growth is growing by around 6.8% a year. So still a very solid rate for Chinese GDP. And because China's economy is just so much larger, it's the second largest economy in the world when you look at purchasing power parity basis, it, is gonna, it's, it still requires a lot of uh, demand from our commodities um, exports. So to me, obviously China is always a concern, but at the moment it looks like the authorities have a firm grip on the Chinese economy. I'll leave it there and open it up for any questions. Um, high household debt in Australia and um, you know on averages your graph was reassuring that net is probably not as high as people say because um, savings you know that people have deposits but given the fact that wage inflation could lead to um, higher rates and then Australia's you know banks have a higher funding cost as well as some of those graphs have shown do you have a sense of how risky you know um, consumers are, particularly borrowers are, uh, given many of them are in interest-only mortgages, they have to face repayments on, the, on these loans, and makes them quite vulnerable in an environment of you know, low wages, less disposable income, uh, and, and high debt overall. Yep, so that's definitely a macro risk. Um, so uh, if, wage, if wage income didn't grow in line with, say, uh, rising rates, then obviously that would be a problem. Um, I don't think it's a problem in terms of loan serviceability. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff stocked up there. So I think if that were to occur, then you'd probably see household consumption slow and that would have a greater macroeconomy effect. But I don't think it would affect the uh, mortgage, ser uh, mortgage serviceability. Um, in terms of uh, rates and those kind of things, I think um, you know, if inflation does, does pick up, if wages growth does pick up and you get uh, rates rising, then I think the RBA would be conscious of the serviceability. So on the an analysis that I've kind of done, uh, around 200 basis point increase in mortgage rates would uh, take loan serviceability um, to its highest levels that it's been since around the, the um, since around its history, basically. So I think the RBA will be very conscious of that, of, um, of, of increasing rates, and we'll do it quite gradually because of that. And also, we've got to remember, those things don't happen instantaneously. It's not like you get a 200 basis point increase on your loan. It happens across time. So it'll be a very gradual increase, and it'll be very much in reaction to wages growth. And I think that's part of the reason why the RBA governor has been out there emphasizing wages growth and wanting wages growth at around 3 to 4% in the long run to be assured of the inflation track. Once he's assured of that inflation track, then you'd see domestic rates rise. Cool. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Tapas. Before I introduce the next panel, I thought I'd just introduce myself, for those who don't know me. My name is Sam Swiss, and I run the Kanga News business, so we report on Australian and New Zealand debt markets. And Chris Dalton, who most of you know, the chief executive of the ASF, couldn't be here today, so he's in Tokyo. So he asked me if I would um, uh, come along and help MC this, this conference. So um, I'm going to introduce Jonathan Mintz, who's um, moderating the next panel. And he will introduce his panelists. And they are going to be talking about the RMBS market. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Mintz. Uh, I work at NAB in Melbourne on the securitization front. Um, so we're hosting a um, RMBS panel today. So maybe if I ask the, so the panelists to come up, and I'll do a quick introduction at that point. 
So um, we'll start from, uh, from the far end. We've got James Faulkner from uh, HSBC uh, who's joining us. Uh, Matthew here from Pepper Group. Cedric Shaban from HSBC Asset Management. Uh, Mary Plowman from Resimac. And Eva Zelli from uh, the NAB Group Funding. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, so I thought what I thought I'd start with is, um, as mentioned earlier on, the the uh, securitisation on the RMBS market in Australia in 2017 was very strong. We had you know sort of record issuance since the GFC, um, which has been sort of a, a big step towards um, I suppose seeing a lot of the issuers from a variety of um, asset classes and issuers um, globally. So. Um, I was just put up a chart here, sort of showing that uh, in sort of 2017 it was sort of 36 billion dollars of issuance. Um, now that's um, obviously almost double what we saw in 2016. Um, so that was a great highlight for the for that year. Um, credit markets and margins came in, um, so it was, it was a very sort of uh, sort of conducive market for issuance, um, and we've had a pretty good start for 2018 as well. Um, we had sort of a mixture of non-ADIs, ADIs, um, non-conforming assets, prime assets. So we really saw a range of issuers and asset classes come to market um, with the non-ADI and the regionals probably um, dominating last year, uh, 2017's issuance. Um, on that note, I might sort of uh, ask a question to the, to the panel here. So uh, maybe Mary, you first. Um, so what are your thoughts on the 2017 um, and why was it so successful from an issuance perspective? Um, and were there new investor pools or uh, was it more supply led? Um, I think um, the answer is probably both. Um, we certainly saw the, um, from the non-bank side, um, businesses grew very strongly, which meant um, the non-banks relying on securitisation as its um, medium term funding tool, that there was a lot of issuance um, to to, to um, put into the market, but we also, um, that increased issuance also attracted um, um, increased demand. So we had investors really engaging um, across across the globe. We've got a, um, a strong global platform, but we saw um, increased interest from the, from the US markets, from the Asian markets, and um, more latterly from Europe. So we, we are seeing they, I mean, both sides of the, of, the, um, of the market need to work together. But we saw really um, the ADIs a bit absent in 2017. They were perhaps um, a less um, issue. Uh, I think um, the NAB was maybe um, an issuer, but there wasn't a lot of issuance out of the ADI sector, particularly the smaller ADIs, but very strong issuance from the, um, from the non-ADIs. And so we we actually saw both sides um, created a strong market. And Cedric, as an investor with a lot of RMBS um, coming through the market, how did you approach it? So, uh, and did you see, or did you buy more last year than in previous years? Yeah, we did allocate more to Australia last year than we did uh, the previous year. Um, we run, uh, I mean, we have a global coverage from, uh, from our team in London. So uh, Australia, in terms of allocation, is up against any of the structured finance as a class in the jurisdiction. So if we look at you know, what we like uh, about Australia, about the, the Australian RMBS uh, investment proposition, we like, we like, the, we like the yield pickup, uh, obviously. We like the geographical diversification. But more importantly, what we like is the, the diversity uh, of what is on uh, offer. Uh, somehow, it seems that the, the Australian market uh, has normalized maybe faster than some, uh, some other markets. Maybe it's because you, maybe you had less queue distortion or things like that. But if uh, what we can find in Australia, we can find high street grade type of collateral. We can find specialist lenders uh, issuing either prime collateral or, or non-conforming or less conforming uh, collateral. Uh, and it's a diversity we struggle to find elsewhere. Uh, if if we look at uh, continental Europe, uh, we see what we don't see much being issued because a lot of the, the high street players are basically they've got cheaper source, other sources of funding and they tend to be a bit sporadic uh, ABS issuers. Uh, and if they issue, they issue mostly seniors that are not really attractive on a, on a, on a written basis. Uh, if we look at the UK, it's a bit better. Uh, what we see from the high street is mostly seniors, but there is also a Quite a lot of specialist lenders that, that you know issue full capital structure. So, uh, but even for the UK on, on a relative value, on a risk-adjusted relative value basis, uh, Australia offers some 
I would say, offers a lot of, a lot of value for us, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, and Matthew, obviously, um, you're a frequent issuer in many different, many different formats, different deal structures, currencies. Um, do your books builds look vastly different each deal, or uh, what sort of drives um, you know the different deal structures? Um, uh, look, I wouldn't say they're vastly different, but certainly there there are some differences, and and that obviously is by design. So yeah. I mean, the reason we offer different structures, and different currencies, and different products programs is to offer investors a variety of product opportunities, and obviously some appeal to some investors and others to others. So obviously when we denominate US dollar tranches, we're attracting a significant diversity of investors from the US who otherwise would not play an A dollar product. Mm. Um, and we offer a couple of varieties of structures there. We offer a one year bullet, uh, which typically appeals to sort of money markets and uh, in style investors. Uh, and then we offer um, some scheduled amortization with, with, with vari varying Wales to them, again, to appeal to sort of a, a, a different audience of US investors even, uh, including uh, you know, life insurance companies that like the longer dated sort of product. And of course, we've got two, pro two platforms. Uh, so we offer both non-conforming and prime. Uh, and we, we, we tend to find um, that investors that will uh, play in our non-conforming will play in both, mm. uh, but then some of our non-conforming investors prefer the yield on the non-conforming and won't play in the prime. Some prime won't play in the non-conforming. So, uh, but typically we, we, we attract a, the vast majority of our investors are in fact real money. Uh, and that does set us perhaps a little bit different from the bank issuers and, and some of the prime issuers that attract a lot of bank bid. But I guess what we're offering doesn't quite necessarily appeal uh, to them. It's different kind of credit appetite. Yep. Um, and I think just to sort of touch on the sort of that relative value sort of discussion, I mean, um, obviously having the Australian collateral, um, you know, historically there's been a lot of issuance offshore into different currencies. I mean, there has been a pickup that in that in, in recent years as well. Um, but I think from a, um, from a sort of a relative value perspective and what the, the Australian RMBS structures do offer up is some variety. Um, I know that, you know, obviously from the non-ADI space, that's always something which is a, a big discussion point um, and something which, you know, in terms of the structure, the asset class, um, the sort of the security repayment profile, um, and obviously there's a yield pickup, Cedric, as, as he mentioned. Um, so there is some, I think, a lot of sort of variety out there and some relative value discussions to be had by the investors. Um, and I think with the issuance in Aussie dollars um, and even structures which incorporate um, sort of either local Aussie or sort of foreign currency, I think that's really helped um, some of the issuance volumes up. Um, you can see here now, I mean, the Aussie dollar uh, issuance is now sort of circa 85 billion. So um, it has definitely picked up in the last 12 to 18 months, which is very pleasing. Um, so I, sort of back to you, Matthew. Um, in terms of, you mentioned you look at both prime and non-conforming. Um, what's your sort of take on the performance of both those asset classes? Um, and obviously, and as Tapas mentioned, you know the performance in Australia has been very good from an RMBS perspective. Um, so, yeah, do you, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, well, I guess the reason that, well, one of the critical reasons that performance has been so strong. Uh, in the Australian economy, and obviously that's true of, of all, all styles of uh, mortgage lending, is, is the healthy economy. And we obviously heard that in the earlier economic presentation. We've had 20 years, I think it is, of uninterrupted positive GDP growth, uh, which has been able to sustain employment levels, and as you mentioned, also interest rates are low. So you've got strong economic backdrop, but we've always also had, in addition to that, very strong servicing standards. Uh, you know, there's been a strong uh, legislative requirement uh, imposed on all lenders, uh, which predates the financial crisis and has been strengthened subsequently, whereby, uh, you know, we, we, we're compelled to ensure that any product that we lend is suitable for the purpose of the, of the customer and, and that they could uh, afford to service it without any form of undue hardship. So I think those factors uh, are important to bear in mind, plus then we, we stress the serviceability of borrowers uh, with a plus 2% interest rate, and that's universal across the entire market, uh, sometimes even by more than 2% because of a flaw. And I think that sort of goes to the comment earlier that should, you know, the question asked in regards to should interest rates rise by a couple of percent, how do we think that will play out? Well, we think because we service customers on that basis that that will play out, play out quite strongly. 
And then, I guess, in regards to uh, the other comment is that the support, the substantial proportion of a non-conforming lending is actually really not truly non-conforming. It's actually sort of more near prime. It is stuff that only just is falling outside of the bank criteria and would have, in fact, met and be eligible for bank criteria a number of years ago. So it's, it's sometimes a, a not necessarily a true moniker to put non-conforming on it. Mm. And Cedric, when you do your credit work, what are you looking at in terms of you know, factors that could influence the underwriting, um, you know, the performance, how does it compare to other jurisdictions, maybe such as the UK? Uh, I would say that you know, we, we, have, we have the same approach. If we look at the UK issuer or an Australian uh, issuer, I would say that, you know, just to give some highlights, but the first thing we tend to focus on, you know, besides this historical performance would be like the robustness of the business model and also the, the type of, uh, of products being offered uh, and, and trying to understand what, uh, what, what is the target uh, customer base for, for these products and how did it compare in terms of margin versus what we can see as high street, uh, lower, lower risk uh, products. So that, that is really the first step. I mean, we have been investing in the Australian market for quite a while now, so uh, we, we have some overview of, of all the main issuers, um, and then we, we benchmark them a, a bit, you know, uh, one, one against each other. Uh, when you come to specialist lenders, there are maybe some lenders we maybe we prefer, prefer the prime production. We may be less keen on their non-prime production. Uh, but yet again, because you, Typically, the, the full capital structure is being offered. Uh, if you like, if you rate a collateral uh, as a bit riskier, you, then you, you might go a bit higher in the, in the capital structure. Um, otherwise, in terms of, um, if I were to compare a bit uh, the UK and, the, and, and Australia, I would say where we see a bit differences is maybe in the, in the investor, investor loan uh, area, what is called in the UK by toilet where um, things are not underwritten exactly the, the same way in the UK. Buy to let is normally uh, underwritten on a self-sustained basis, meaning that you know that the yield from the, from the investment property has to, uh, to be sufficient to support uh, the servicing of the loan, whereas in Australia it's the case because maybe the motivations for the borrowers uh, might be a bit different. But, but here we would see maybe, maybe a, some of a more robust proposition from a, in the UK than what we can see in Australia. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, in the UK, typically, uh, you don't get blending pools with, uh, with buy tool, I mean, investor loans and uh, unoccupied uh, prime loan. Usually, you know, they, they, are, they are issued in, uh, in distinct transactions, and buy tool let typically price at a concession to, uh, to prime. In Australia, it's a bit more difficult because you see sometimes, you know, uh, you, you can see proportions of investment loans creeping up, and from a relative value basis, from a pricing perspective, it's, sometimes it's a bit, you know, it's a bit difficult to, uh, to really assess the value there. Uh, that being said, you know, what we are hearing is that margin on the, on the investment loans um, tend to go up in Australia at the moment, so, so maybe there would be some room, maybe in the future, to, uh, to, get, a bit, uh, to get paid a bit more, maybe, <laughs> for taking the risk of investment loans. But, <laughs> You need to look at our I prime program. <laughs> um, and James, obviously, you're probably more than sort of the trading side. From a relative value perspective, um, what's your sort of take on Aussie RMBS and versus other products you might look at? Yeah, I mean, we sit in London and we look at uh, all the non-North American products, and uh, you know, you compare the Australian RMBS market, particularly to the European market, and it looks it looks very attractive. Um, you know, there was a major um, issuer that came in Europe last week um, uh, from the Dutch market. They priced at 18 at the senior level. Um, you know, Dutch market, you're probably looking at um, mid, mid teens for a, a secondary market trading level. So, um, and, and, and there was a stage when Dutch would trade pretty close to the Australian market. Um, and then you look at the other geographies, you, you have um, maybe French, uh, Irish, um, maybe even Spanish in the sort of 20s and 30s. Um, Italy obviously dropped back a little bit last week, but you're still, you know, I saw a couple of trades in the sort of 50, low 50s area at the senior level there. Um, and then, of course, the, the UK market uh, obviously depends on currency and tenor, but you're probably looking at 30 to 40 over. So then you look at a, you know, a, a, a major bank, um, and I traded a major last week in sort of the mid 90s, um, and this is 
prime collateral. So even for investors who uh, um, need to swap back into uh, euros, um, I think the cost of a swap is uh, probably in the low 40s, even you know, once you factor in the cost of that swap. Um, the Australian market, um, from a valuation perspective, looks, uh, looks very attractive, and I think uh, that's the reason why we've seen increased en engagement um, in the Australian market from Europe and, and the US as well. Um, I mean, th there are probably some reasons why it should be a little bit cheaper. I mean, clearly in Europe, there's been barely any supply. Um, you know, a lot of investors feel like they've had to, uh, there's been a lot of competition in the secondary market, and that's driven spreads tighter over the last three or four years in Europe. Um, and obviously, you've had uh, uh, the um, involvement of the central bank, which has skewed things a little bit. Um, whereas in Australia, investors, if, if, if they're struggling to get um, RMBS paper, they, they can be a bit more patient and wait for new issues to come. You know, the, as we've seen, the supply of new issues has, has been better. But there's no doubt in my mind, you know, you, you get paid better to own, you know, assets which, you know, are good quality, um, especially compared to some of the European uh, deals um, at cheaper levels. Thanks. And um, so from Eva, from your perspective, I mean, NAB has a number of funding options um, and funding tools at, at your disposal. In terms of RMBS and that as a funding tool, how does that fit in to your overall decision making? Well, we do have a sizeable term funding task. So that being the case, we do try and diversify as much as we can our funding products and investors. And uh, we feel RMBS enables us to do that. And the way we view it is issuing an RMBS can save on a, a trip to the offshore markets in the senior space, thereby creating a little bit more, I guess, scarcity value in those products. I think the, the form of execution for RMBS is also quite different to senior. It's, it takes longer to bring an RMBS trade to market, but the ability to speak to investors beforehand, get some anchor demand also helps with the execution certainty. And that's something that you don't really see in the senior space. So that element of execution is also different and helpful. Um, and I guess there's the pricing element as well. I mean, it's always uh, difficult to compare an RMBS on a WOW basis to senior unsecured, and I don't think that's a fair comparison. But issuing a capital relief trade makes the economics a lot more attractive as well. So it stacks up in terms of the uh, investor diversification, in terms of the pricing, the execution process. So you know, we see it as quite a viable product and a valuable tool in our funding mix. I guess um, last year we probably we, we didn't issue, and you know um, I know our reasons, and maybe they're the same reason as the other ADIs as well. Um, that was largely regulatory driven in terms of the net stable funding ratio, which came into effect January this year. And funding only securitizations, which is typically how we would uh, issue in the RMBS space, uh, dilutive for that ratio, if you have a number in mind. So that also explains the trend away from funding only to capital relief uh, as well. And, and the fact that you know issuing a capital relief RMBS is neutral for the NSFR. So no negative impact on the regulatory ratio, positive economics and investor diversification uh, would be the key reasons it's one of our funding tools. Um, and I guess moving on to sort of, I guess, the regulatory change, Tapas touched on that uh, briefly as well. You know, APRA has obviously been putting or monitoring the, sort of the investor sort of percentage of new lending in Australia, the interest only in Australia. Um, and I think that's obviously that's put a bit of a, um, a sort of a light on that part of the market. Um, now, I think, you know, with the Royal Commission now um, being an underway, um, that's obviously quite a topical discussion point. Um, from investors in Europe, um, particularly given the amount of publicity it gets um, and what does end up coming over to Europe from Australia. Um, I think this sort of obviously remains something which is you know, well looked at. I think there's still recommendations to go up, so I don't think there's anywhere we can sort of have a crystal ball on that perspective. But maybe Eva, back to you, you know, as, as um, sort of the, you know, the group treasury team of a, of a major sort of bank, um, there's obviously a significant amount of publicity around this. Um, we know the outcomes of recommendations are still yet to be decided and to be and a little bit unknown. Um, so what do you, how do you see that affecting sort of mortgage lending um, and even more broadly on bank funding? Well, I think, you know, you're right. It's really early to speculate, 
but you know I do think there will be um, far-reaching consequences. Um, you know, the Royal Commission still has some time to run, but we are expecting a draft report towards the end of this year. But what it is creating is a lot of uncertainty in the market. So I'm off the back end now of a non-deal credit um, roadshow in Europe. And it was one topic that came up in every meeting without exception. So that and, and the housing market, as you would expect. Uh, what the Royal Commission does is create this this sense of uncertainty for investors. So, you know, the questions were around, um, will this change your lending? Um, will this impact originations? And it, it's, it's difficult to tell. Um, the process is the Commission will make recommendations to the government and the government obviously needs to determine what they will implement. Um, but, you know, there's been a lot of focus certainly on consequence management, on financial incentives. So, you know, I, I would expect to see some far-reaching recommendations, but ultimately it will be the government of the day that, uh, that's got to decide. Uh, Mary, uh, from a sort of a non-ADI sort of um, lens, um, you know, the, the mortgage volumes have been increasing um, significantly over the last few years from this space. Um, is this uh, as a result of regulatory change um, faced by the banks or the ADIs, or can you comment on how ResBank look at that, or where do you think that will sort of impact your funding for the next few years? Um, so where we, we've seen a change or a shift in market share um, away from the four majors and more recently to the to the non-bank space. I think that is um, that has been driven initially by um, regulatory change. In fact, probably started go back to Bar three slash four with the capital weight, um, where the the mortgages did did require um, greater capital, and that meant that all that from that point on. The, um, the non-banks and the smaller, there was a, it's a much, was a much more level playing field. But the other real driver to change um, in terms of the building non-bank is also the consumer. I think there is um, an element of a, a need for choice away from um, just a small number of participants. And if we look at um, the height of the crisis, 95% um, of new, new mortgage lending was done by four banks. And that really was not was not something that was going to be um, seen positively by as a positive for consumers. So I think generally we do as long as it is a reasonably level playing field. We have operating credit markets, um, and which allow the the non banks to compete. Um, we will see people move away from from the from the major banks. So. For example, if I said to you 95% during the peak of the crisis was written by the four majors in terms of new business, um, earlier this year that number was probably 70 to 75%. This, it's a market that writes 30 billion of um, new business a month, so that's a very big shift um, of business to um, other participants who are then going to um, look at wholesale markets as, me, as a means of funding and therefore create a lot more issuance and, um, and I think a lot more demand in this space. So I think we've seen, we do think um, that the non-banks in particular are growing. The smaller, the smaller ADIs are also growing. I think it's just going to be a much more broadly spread market. We, we are still a very small part of the market in terms of the, the overall size. We would still only be around seven percent of the total of the total market, which is still considered quite small, obviously. And um, but we are much more aligned on wholesale markets, so that that will create a lot of of um, supply demand um, in, in the securitization markets. Yep. And uh, Matthew, sort of, uh, do you expect sort of the regulations of the non-banks uh, to increase in the future? Uh, how does the, sort of the Pepper Group look at that? Um, look, we do expect a modest amount of increase in regulation. I guess though the first point I want to make is we already are heavily regulated. So we all have to be, all the non-banks have to be licensed by ASIC, Australian Securities and Investment Corp Commission under uh, our required Australian financial services licences. 
Um, and of course, we're massively scrutinized as well. I mean, on virtually every single one of our loans is looked at by somebody, whether it's a rating agency, whether it's the banks that provide our funding, whether it's the MES that provide our funding, when we term out our issuances. So we feel that we're pretty heavily regulated as it is. But um, more recently, I think APRA has been taking more of an interest, uh, and that's in two different ways. Like, um, one, they've been asking for more reporting to be provided to them. Um, from the banks uh, in regards to the warehouses that they are providing, uh, and, and we're, we're seeing evidence of that. And then secondly, there was some legislation introduced uh, and passed recently, which provides APRA with reserve powers to regulate um, non-bank sectors if and when there is an event where they feel that the sector is perhaps um, causing some concern to the stability of the, of, of the financial sector. APRA is on notice as saying that they don't believe, uh, and I think at the time we were having the conversations, we were sort of saying the market was about 5%. I hear Mary just there suggesting that's grown a little bit from there to perhaps 7%, but in any event, they've acknowledged that it's not significant enough to think that we could ever seriously concern, cause concern to the stability of the economy, but nonetheless, they want that power in case somewhere in the future they need to use it. So, uh, yeah, I. I I, I think it's steady she goes. I don't see an enormous amount coming out of all of that. Yeah, thanks. Um, I suppose also then sort of looking forward to, you know, 2018. Um, I think so. I mean, year to date, it's been about just over $10 billion of issuance. Um, if you look back to the original slide, that's about on par where we were this time last year for 2017. Um, now I think you know it's fair to say that there's still going to be a fair amount of uh, supply um, from the Aussie r and space, and you know accessing international investors still remains a very key task of every issuer. Um, and you know from a NAB perspective, obviously we're very supportive of that. We sort of look to see what currency structures can be put forward, and um, you know to help the issuers tap into these pockets of demand. Um, you know we look to encourage and sort of uh, see this um, part of the market grow over the course of this year. Um, James, I mean, from your perspective, um, you sort of looking at sort of RMBS, the, the 2018, are you going to increase your sort of interest or how, how do you see it playing out? Um, yeah, I mean, in, in, in terms of on, on the secondary market uh, side, we've seen uh, quite a significant uh, pickup in uh, overall volumes. Um, uh, we're lucky uh, with HSBC in that we've got uh, um, a, a global spread. So uh, we've got uh, a sales force on the ground in Sydney um, who engage with the domestic investors there. Um, and clearly with the, uh, all the issuance that came last year, um, there was uh, naturally a, a pickup in secondary market uh, activity. Um, a lot of that people looking to uh, uh, use the secondary market to raise cash. Um, but of course, people also looking to use the secondary market to uh, reinvest repayments or, or coupons or, um, um, or when they've uh, had new cash uh, come into funds uh, to invest that. So we've had very um, good activity domestically. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, we've also had um, increased interest from outside Australia, uh, some of that uh, due to the valuations um, and also people, you know, pretty comfortable with the market, you know, when they've done their work, they've, um, you know, seen the, 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 the performance of uh, Australian uh, RMBS uh, over a number of years and also the other things that have been alluded to, um, like regulation and uh, uh, good servicing and things like that has helped. So um, there's, there's been better confidence from outside Australia, both, you know, mainly um, in, in Europe and uh, in the US. Um, and that's led to a, a significant pickup in volumes uh, um, um, f from those two geographies as well, which has been good. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we expect that to, to continue, really. Um, I mean, some of it obviously caused by the, the difficult technical uh, situation in, in, in the European markets. But uh, um, I think, uh, um, you know, with all the issuance that's come, it uh, should continue to lead to uh, pretty good uh, secondary volumes. and. Uh, participation in, in, in the markets. Great, thank, thank you. And Cedric, um, in terms of your sort of uh, Aussie RMBS uh, holdings for the year and what we, what's on sort of your radar, radar and what sort of, sort of deals, issuance structures will look like, um, you know, will you have interest in? I think, you know, we've been investing uh, in uh, Australian RMBS for like 15 years now. So it, it has been, you know, it has been on the radar screen for quite a while. And, and I doubt it, it is going to drop uh, off the, the radar screen uh, for the rest of the year. Um, I mean, all things being equal from a fundamental risk uh, perspective. Uh, if, if you look at the technicals, 
what could drive us, you know, maybe are looking a bit away from Australia. <coughs> if you look at what one could expect from a continental Europe, I think it's not very likely that we'll see uh, suddenly, you know, a lot of issuance, especially in the May space, that could yield a bit more, and then could, could maybe provide some investment opportunities that, that could a bit challenge, you know, what we can get in Australia. So I, I don't think I, I don't see uh, much risk uh, there. Uh, what would be more interesting to watch is maybe what, what happens to UK spread, uh, because maybe the technicals, I don't know, people expect that, you know, issuance should pick up there, so uh, let's see what happens with, uh, with the technicals. But certainly the, the spread differentials between, uh, between UK spread, especially, especially slenders, and, and what we can pick up in, uh, in Australia and Australia, it, it's something we, uh, we monitor, it, it, and it is something that, can, that could eventually uh, impact the, the, the relative allocation between the between the two jurisdictions. And uh, Matthew, so presumably PEP have some more funding to do this year. Any comments on what investors can expect to see or uh, what you sort of hope to achieve this year? Yeah, we've certainly got some more funding to do. So we've issued twice so far this year. And I think you can anticipate that we'll issue at least twice more. Um, in all likelihood, there will be some US dollars on offer. Uh, we will continue to explore the euro and sterling, and, and, and if it works economically, we will certainly consider that as an option as well. Unfortunately, in recent times, it hasn't quite been in our favour, but that can always change. Um, potentially something off our offshore platforms. We're a global company. Uh, we could be offering something off our uh, UK residential mortgage platform towards the end of the year. And, I think in 2019, um, we're likely to bring something from our auto platform in Australia as well. Um, and Eva, um, so earlier this year, NAB issues uh, the first ever green tranche in an Aussie RMBS transaction. Um, so what, what drove the inclusion of this tranche? Um, what are your thoughts um, on whether we'll see more of this either from NAB or from the market more broadly? Uh, yes, climate change is a major issue facing society today and we believe uh, business can do its part to uh, play a role in addressing this. So that um, formed part of the motivation for um, issuing the green tranche. At NAB we've kind of led the way in SRI issuance, being the first major bank to issue a green bond um, domestically. We were the first uh, bank to issue a social bond and now the first to uh, incorporate a, a green RMBS tranche certified by the Climate Bond Initiative. Um, the bank has targets around financing um, the transition to a low carbon economy. That's our targets are 55 billion in terms of financing by 2025, and this contributes to that. And so, um, it's actually a really positive way for group funding and treasury to um, align in a very direct way with the enterprise objectives and um, you know, be seen to provide, um, I guess, positive guidance to the community in general. So I think it's something we'll definitely continue to do. It's quite a rare product offering. So um, you know, I expect the investor base to grow over time and I would actually expect to see more issuers to come to market over time with similar offerings. Mm. Um, and Mary, finally, sort of your outlook for 2018, uh, sort of confident the market will remain positive, steady. What's your views? Um, thanks, Joanna. I think we feel um, the fundamental um, story around the assets continues to be as strong as ever. So um, as, as Matt was saying earlier, we have a very strong underwriting ethos in Australia, strong regulatory environment, um, stable, stable macro conditions as we, we heard earlier. So um, I think domestically the, the assets will continue to perform. We will see um, growth in the non-bank sector. I, I'm sure um, most people in this room are aware of the investments made by um, the credit funds within PE that have invested in the non-bank space. What that tells you is there is um, a, a view more broadly that, that that part of the market will grow. So we will see um, that entire, um, our, our, all our businesses um, are going to attract greater market share and therefore there'll be, there'll be greater issuance. So from our point of view, we are very positive. We've got a strong fund program uh, lined up for 
um, this this calendar year and and going forward. And we're and we're very excited about the interest that we're now seeing coming out of Europe. Um, Europe was um, the the sort of last area to to um, show strong interest, notwithstanding. I mean, Cedric has been um, a bit of a um, a bit of he was a bit of a lone wolf there for a while. But um, we are seeing some some other investors coming into our programs in Aussie dollars. As, as Matt said, we all look continue to look at euro and sterling as options. We, we're in fact currency agnostic um, in terms of issuance as long as it works um, when we um, when we bring it back on shore. So um, I think what is interesting is that if you look at Australia as an issuer, I think um, during 2017 we were one of the um, largest non-agency or the largest non-agency issuer in, in RMBS. So I mean that means that um, global investors are taking an interest. So that's, that's, it is a, there is a lot of different options to buy from, from very, very prime all the way down the, the credit curve. So I think when you have great supply that attracts great interest. So I think that will continue. Yep. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much. I'll maybe take some questions if anyone has any from the floor. Well, I'm only first asking questions. So, so um, with uh, a higher share of smaller ADIs in the market and also a move away from the large four, um, smaller ADIs, non ADIs, and less in fear of the four lenders, do panelists expect to see greater dispersion in the years ahead as perhaps people are chasing market share um, you know, with, with, more, with more issuance and more you know, lenders in the market? I, I, if I could um, just answer that one. I think what we had was an incredibly <coughs> concentrated market. So where, where, which as you, as you would know, um, an environment where 95% of the lending is done by four um, banks, that was a, um, seen as actually a very concentrated oligo yeah, whatever that word is, with <laughs> an oligo <laughs> in it, um, uh, market. So what we see now is a, is a much more normalised market, much better spread. It is an extremely well regulated market across all the participants. On the lending side, we are all governed by the National Consumer Credit Protection Act. The responsible rent lending code in, Aust in Australia is very strong. The underwriting criteria is very strong. So we think it's a positive, a positive um, for consumers and also a positive um, for lenders and investors. So I think it's, it is um, more diverse, but we think that's a strength. Yeah, no, no, well said. Thank you. Any other questions? We'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you very much to the panel uh, members today. Um, hopefully everyone found that informative. Um, but you know, any questions afterwards, uh, please come through and um, ask, the, ask the question. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jonathan and the panel. We're going to have a tea break now. You've got a little bit more time for networking than was originally planned, so we'll meet back at quarter two. Thanks. <laughs>
for the day. We've discussed the RMBS sector and now we're looking at the ABS sector. We have a new addition to the panel which wasn't on our original agenda, so apologies to Jonathan Street from Think Tank who is joining the panel and his name's not up there. And I'll hand over to James Canaris from Westpac who is moderating and can introduce his panel. Good morning all and, and thank you, Samantha, for that introduction. So uh, my name is James Canaris. I'm a director in structured finance at Westpac Banking Corporation. I'll be your moderator today for what is probably the most exciting panel, I think, of, uh, of this morning, which is uh, the outlook for the ABS sector. So just looking at that slide, you can see the ABS sector uh, certainly went from strength to strength last year. In fact, we had over close to $7 billion of issuance and it was the best year on record. We saw the emergence of new asset classes, notably credit card and personal loan transactions. And while 2018 has seen a slower start to the year, diversification away from residential mortgages continues to be a strong selling point for the sector. On today's panel, we'll discuss the outlook for the ABS sector, including issuance volumes, ongoing collateral diversification, and relative value considerations. Uh, and here to join me on the panel, I might just call up our panelists. Wanna come up? So at the far end, we have Jonathan Street. Uh, he's the CEO of Think Tank, and Think Tank's a small ticket commercial property lender and ABS issuer. And next to Jonathan, we have Jean Sebastian Paley, Senior Portfolio Manager at International Finance Corporation. Sitting next to Jean Sebastian is Kevin Lee, Director Structuring and Origination at Macquarie Bank. And finally, last but not least, uh, Jennifer Hellerud, Director Securitization at RBC Capital Markets. Thank you, panel. So I'd like to begin um, starting on the theme of collateral diversification by asking Jonathan briefly, what are the key underwriting differences between an Australian residential mortgage and small ticket commercial mortgage? Thanks, James. Uh, I think I could start off with a suggestion that there's actually more similarities than there are perhaps differences between what we do as a small ticket commercial originator and uh, typical RMBS, which most of the room would be very, very conversant with. Um, first of all, we offer 25 to 30 year fully amortising loans. They might have uh, an interest only period up front for, for one to five years, but these loans fully amortise thereafter. So there's no bullets or, or shorter duration loans. Uh, they're all, or not all, but uh, the vast majority, around 98% are variable rate and adjustable, so we, we can move our, our benchmark rate in, in alignment with uh, other shifts in either the, the swap rate or um, changes in, in cost of funds, so quite, quite flexible in that regard. Uh, average balance on the unconsolidated basis uh, is around the same as RESI. It's a little bit higher, um, but it's not that dissimilar. Um, we also have a good spread between investor and, and owner-occupier across the portfolio. In our case, it's, it's about 52, 48 in favour of investors. And you would expect that in uh, the commercial space, I guess. But again, similar to, to RMBS. Um, we have a very similar borrower set. So you can uh, look at our transactions that we've got in the market and look at other issuance, particularly in auto and, and um, Asset back, other asset back, but um, we, we have a similar sort of SME and self-employed um, borrower profile. And uh, there's, there's very good geographic diversification across the, the assets as well. So we're predominantly metro, we have a little bit of non-metro, but all of the major centres as well, but around the country. Um, equally, CPRs, pretty similar when, when you look at it. Uh, so from, a, from an investor point of view, it's always a key point of focus. Uh, and uh, we've found that it's very similar to, um, to RMBS. And uh, when it comes to arrears and losses, our performance has been uh, pretty good. So our, our current uh, arrears at the moment are around 0.64 of a percent, and we've only got one loan out of the whole portfolio that's, that's 90 days or greater. So th they're all the broad similarities. That you did say briefly, but I'll, <laughs> I'll get to a point. Um, 
the, um, the, the parts where we do diverge are more around um, probably our rates are a little bit higher. We're, we're forced up. There's a lot more credit support that goes into these loans. Um, thank you, S&P. And, um, and consequently, we're, we're a little bit wider than, than where RMBS is, particularly prime and near prime. Not too far out, but we do compete day on day out with the banks. If we don't get a loan, it's typically gone to one of the majors or one of the second tiers. So that gives you an idea of where we sit in, in the frame of things. Um, property itself, the, whilst it's generic, it's not as homoge homogeneous as, um, as resi, so we, we apply a, a lot more analysis to the type of properties that we uh, take on as security, and um, uh, that's where our special, uh, specialisation really comes from, from the, the backgrounds of the principals and senior management. Maximum LVR, um, 75 in our case, obviously a lot higher in resi. Uh, weighted average basis, though, we're, we're pretty similar. Current weighted average LVR in the book is around 63.5%, so uh, relatively con conservative. Serviceability, uh, we apply the same sort of approach as in RESI, but we haven't added that, that extra layer again because we would typically have between three and six counterparties on each, each loan as opposed to RESI, you've typically got a husband and wife. And so we're, we're analysing all of those and uh, we're also analysing the characteristics of the commercial property itself uh, for, for what it is, industrial, retail, office. Um, all of those things have different bearings uh, on, on the outcomes of how we analyse and price the credit. Valuation, again, we, we have a panel of commercial valuers uh, very specialised in that field. We will only use a value for a property in that location that they cover. Um, and we end up with sort of 40 to 100 page valuations that come out of the forensic analysis of the property, the tenants, the tenancy profile, other characteristics that are relevant to that property and location and industry. And um, I think that's probably enough for everybody to try and digest, but um, broadly speaking, more similarities than dissimilarities. Thanks, thanks for that overview, Jonathan. Um, in terms of trends, what are you seeing in the small ticket commercial lending sector and how's this impacted your volume growth and potentially ABS issuance plans? Uh, well, I suppose the most obvious trend in recent times has been uh, the, the investment that's being made in the non-bank sector and particularly some adjacent um, parties in, in our industry uh, from offshore. So there's, there's some big money coming into the sector of late and um, it's really causing a, a stirring in the, in the non-bank area, particularly the ABS side that, that we're in. So you've seen um, uh, a couple of, uh, three or four transactions in the space over the last 12 or so months, and they will increasingly bear fruit uh, in terms of origination activity and, and issuance, I think. Um, in our own case, we, we've um, had a, a major party come on our register um, which I can elaborate on a little bit later, but um, the, uh, the large players coming in are going to have a profound impact, I think. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's a little bit more of the same. So we, we did see in the NAB charts earlier how um, you know, that there is a good growth outlook and characteristics of performance in the economy, um, and that will play out well for us. But um, on the contra, you know, I think originators are becoming a little bit more conservative or have become more conservative and will probably come increasingly so. So tighter credit underwriting is, is certainly a prevailing theme. Uh, and turning now to the auto and equipment sector, Kevin, what trends have you seen in the sector over the last 12 months and how will this impact asset back volumes going forward? Sure, I think um, firstly the, the backdrop, the Australian economic fundamentals are positive as we, we heard earlier this morning. So that's that's been very helpful to the, uh, the ABS uh, originator space. Um, I think origination volumes have still been quite strong. Um, credit performance has been stable. Um, so that, that whole sort of backdrop has been very, very benign. Um, within that, in terms of the ABS issuance specifically, I think year to date, we're probably a little bit behind last year's record volumes, as you said there, James. So I think year to date, we're about um, one and a half billion of ABS issuance out of the Australian market, whereas the same time last year was probably closer to about $4 billion. But notwithstanding the slightly slower volumes, um, the good story is the, the variety we're seeing. So already year to date we've seen um, Latitude come with credit cards, uh, Volkswagen with a, an auto deal, um, Flexi with a consumer loan, uh, back portfolio with, uh, with, with a green tranche in there as well. So 
you know, I think that, that diversity story is very positive. And um, perhaps, you know, with that slightly st slower start to volumes uh, so far this year, we may see a bit more of a catch up in the second half. Thank you, Kevin. We continue to see significant M&A activity in the non-bank sector with KKR recently acquiring Pepper and Blackstone taking a majority interest in La Trobe. Jennifer, do you see this trend continuing and do you expect to see greater volumes of ABS being issued as a result of non-bank lenders changing landscape? Yeah, sure. Thanks, James. So I think the, the smart money says yes, and it's not hard to see why the big PE firms are attracted to the non-bank mortgage originated market particularly. Um, private equity has identified Australia's $1.7 trillion mortgage market as a growth opportunity, particularly in response to the constraints uh, the banking sector is facing at the moment. So with the backing of private equity, I expect to see non-bank lenders grow take more market share away from the, um, the bank lenders. And I expect we'll see more frequent issuer, issu issuances and, um, and, and larger transactions um, subject to market conditions remaining constructive. Um, but I also expect to see new ABS issuers come to market too across a variety of asset classes. And I think there's really two key sources there. So the first is the, um, the existing lenders and issuers who have traditionally offered residential mortgage-backed products but are um, diversifying into adjacent asset classes. And um, Matthew O'Hare touched on this. Um, you know, PEPA is broadening its product base to include um, auto loans and personal loans. And with the support of private equity, you know, th this will certainly um, support PEPA's uh, objectives. Um, and in fact, you know, he, he touched on potentially coming to market next year with their first auto loan transaction. So the other future source of issuance is really from the fintech sector. Um, the fintechs are responding to parts of the market traditionally underserviced by the banking sector. Um, and therefore, you know, they're, they're covering a spectrum of asset classes from consumer finance to SME lending to funding of tertiary assets and green assets. So I think as we see the fintechs become more mature and, and develop some track history um, and develop more sustainable and robust funding models, securitisation will certainly become a really critical source of funding for them. Um, you know, we've already seen a number of fintechs like Prosper, the SME lender, uh, establish warehouse funding. So, you know, once again, as um, critical mass is achieved, um, and track record demonstrated, I expect we will see a number of um, new issuers come to market across a variety of asset classes. And John, Sebastian, what asset classes can you consider and do you have any particular preferences? So at IFC, we, we can uh, consider a fairly broad range of, of underlying collateral, uh, obviously, you know, residential, but also uh, all the new collateral types we've seen in Australia lately, including you know, credit cards, personal loans. Uh, auto loans, uh, some equipments, um, and on an ad, ad hoc basis, we can also uh, do a bit more credit work for the non-pre-approved non asset classes. So, um, in that context, we um, we really welcome the diversification, you know, that the, the new market development has brought to us, and um, always on the lookout, you know, for interesting value value opportunities. I would say, fantastic. We've seen a slowdown in the Australian property market of late and obviously uh, centred in particular as Sydney and Melbourne house prices. Jonathan, are there any pockets of stress um, that you're seeing in your loan portfolio over the last 12 months? And if so, how are you managing this? Uh, yes, well, I think with commercial, uh, there are some different dynamics that drive our particular part of the market. Um, typically, the, the security properties are, are analysed by us and valuers on a, a yield basis, so uh, slightly different to, to a house. Um, and and the, the business occupiers that are in them as well. So we're looking at interest rates, we're looking at employment, um, we're looking at GDP growth, we're looking at general business confidence, we're looking at payment cycle times. And at the moment, all of those are, are headed in, in a positive direction, even though housing is softening. Um, there is a link for us with, with housing and the, and the health of the housing market and the sentiment in the housing market because we're typically dealing with these SME and uh, self-employed people and they've got 
homes. They've got investment properties typically. And if they're comfortable around the equity and the outlook for those other assets, major assets they have, they're more inclined to engage in, in a significant transaction for a commercial property, either a purchase or a refinance or equity, equity release. Um, there's a tipping point individually that um, stops people from transacting when they're not so confident around where their net wealth is in, in housing. So there is a correlation there. It's around sentiment for the most part um, as a decision maker. And so there's a little bit of a retracement at the moment in terms of how people are uh, behaving in terms of wanting um, additional commercial finance, but business is driving things more than housing uh, at the present time. Um, our book's performing well, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're always wary and cautious, and so when we talk about pockets of stress, some of those have never gone away from our point of view. There's parts of, say, Perth, Adelaide in particular, um, where industrial property um, is just not recovered from where there was a downturn almost a decade ago. And um, those areas have, have got longer to go before they're um, back to any sort of form of, of, of comparable health to other parts of the market. So w w no matter how well the, the economy is performing, we're always wary, we're always cautious, we're always looking at these areas that w we're effectively looking to avoid. Um, and uh, consequently, um, I think it's fair to say in our area, there are persistent areas of stress. They vary from time to time. Um, but as it's been over the last 10 years, some of them just have not gone away. And John, Sebastian, what gets you comfortable with Australian credit risk? Um, do you gain comfort by the quality of underwriting and the credit support that's offered in those transactions? So I would say we look at these factors, but um, we do that a bunch of factors all together in when you know, weigh the pros and cons. Um, I think you know, the, the business model is definitely one of those. Uh, the depth of the pockets, the availability of you know, various funding sources. And moving on to the collateral, obviously, you know, the intensity of the, of, of the credit, the, the aggressivity in the underwriting. Um, obviously, when you get comfortable with that, and if you get comfortable with that, the structure, um, associated counterparties, associated extension risk, and I would say finally servicing as well, because you know it's not enough to origin the collateral, but obviously you have to service it uh, afterwards. So looking at at all this, you know, we we may or may not get comfortable. In the case we do, um, then putting this again into the relative value uh, proposition, where does that fit compared to other opportunities we see globally? And if that works at a certain point in time, we would look to invest. Great. And we heard obviously in the panel before about the Royal Commission um, and obviously putting a spotlight on some of the lending practices um, of some of our major lending institutions. Jonathan, have you seen any change? Well, we haven't obviously seen any sort of formal recommendations yet from the Royal Commission. Have you seen any change in lending practices as a result of the Royal Commission? Well, I think it was Mary in the earlier panel who, who mentioned that, um, and others actually, that, that the practices of lenders have been changing since really 2014. And it's really a continuation of that theme. The Royal Commission has um, unearthed some things that probably needed to come out. Um, and banks in particular have responded uh, in, a, in an increasingly forensic way. And um, that's good for, for non-banks, I think, in, in many respects. But all lenders, us in, included, are really um, responding to that. So yeah, it's too early to tell whether there'll be any further recommendations out of it that, that might tend to come on top of the, the high level of scrutiny that we already have and compliance. But um, we just saw at the end of last week, a special counsel, counsel assisting the commission came out and said that um, there are no additional recommendations for um, small business. So uh, recognition that some, some people have taken out loans that they really shouldn't have applied for in the first place, but the lenders still have more work to do in some areas as well. But there's nothing overtly uh, that is likely to come on top in, in that area. Um, so we probably anticipate more regulation, but we think it's more likely to come around the scrutiny because this is so politicised now. It's not going to go away after the Royal Commission hands in its findings and recommendations. Um, at all levels of government, all regulatory bodies will continue their scrutiny in this area. And I think that creates opportunities for, for non-banks in particular. 
and uh, those who do keep up to speed with their record keeping, their compliance and their reporting will do well. But anecdotally, there, there are other developments that are unhelpful. So I was speaking to a broker um, last week and we, we get most of our introductions through the finance broker channel. And he said he, he was dealing with a residential mortgage with a, a second tier, um, it was actually owned by a major. And um, he'd submitted a typical loan application for a husband and wife. He'd put in a credit card balance of $3,000 and it was rejected because the, the statement at the end of the month said it was $3,003.27 and until he corrected that, um, it wouldn't go any further. So he had to resubmit the entire loan once again. So that's okay, getting attention to detail right, um, but it, there's ways in which engagement with the, the broker and, the, and the, the applicants at the end of that process will help some lenders much more than it will help others depending on how it's approached. And John Sebastian, has the Royal Commission impacted your view of Australian ABS or does it reinforce the strong regulatory environment that we have in the lending sector? So I would say it's a bit of a double hedge words in, in the sense that this brings out you know, some themes that you probably wouldn't want to see as an investor. Um, but um, on the other hand, you know, we've, we've seen the regulators stepping in in quite a few jurisdictions over the past decade you know, for various reasons. And um, it's at the margin, you know, it's, it's rather positive to see the regulator getting involved, proactively trying to address or identify potential concerns as opposed, you know, to let the situation deteriorate. So again, you know, not a desirable solution, uh, situation because of the uncertainty it brings and, you know, whatever the recognition may be, but at the margin, quite positive that the regulator um, reasserts its uh, desire, you know, to, uh, to address this um, in, over the medium term. So, um, if anything, it probably gives us some comfort, you know, that the regulator is, uh, is quite proactive, which we've seen in Australia over the past, you know, a uh, few years. And Jonathan, just briefly, are there any other regulatory changes over the last 12 months that have impacted your business? Oh, m most particularly uh, the, the change in capital risk weights in, in warehouse funding for APS 120. Uh, that, that's probably been the most profound uh, factor for us, James. So our, uh, the risk weights have gone up, cost of funds has gone up. Um, we've adjusted that. We, we actually dealt with that in the, in the second quarter of last year. So we had it all documented and set by July and we've focused on the optimization of those capital settings and utilization uh, of the capital that we have at hand um, going forward. So that, that all came in 1st of, of January. We're, we're well prepared for that. Um, in, in other respects, th there's this overlay of, of further responsible lending um, that, that's interceding with our sector as well. We, we tend to utilize that approach anyway. So we're well prepared for it again. And then there's, there's a, uh, a further consequence of, um, there was a, a report by um, uh, Lady Kate Carnell uh, looking at small business lending and recommended various changes to uh, loan contracts that were a little bit more fair to uh, the end user as opposed to the bank. And these sort of strike out things like non-monetary defaults, which we've never really relied on anyway. Uh, in our case, uh, we're, we're a commercial property lender, so we're more interested in monetary defaults. Um, as a natural consequence of where the asset performs and, and the net bottom line on that. Um, so we, we again had little work to do in that area because our, our loan contract's pretty much consistent with that anyway. And Jennifer, Jonathan obviously mentioned about APS 120 and the increased capital requirements. Um, how has that impacted ABS warehouse funding from the banks? Yeah, thanks James. And um, I, I know we've done APS 120 to death, so um, bear with me because I think there are a couple of important themes to draw out as it relates to ABS warehouse funding and um, particularly compared to RMBS funding. So as we all know, in determining regulatory capital under the, um, the current ABS 120, we have uh, two approaches available. One is the external ratings based approach and the other is the standardised approach. Um, with the minimum possible risk weighting that may be achieved of 15%. Um, so really, in order to minimise the regulatory capital that the APRA regulated uh, warehouse providers are required to hold, we're seeing increasing levels of credit enhancement. So whether that be because a, a AAA rating is being targeted or as a result of a couple of inputs into the supervisory formula that um, really have the impact of um, increasing risk-weighted assets quite significantly. Um, so one of those factors is um, the 90 plus arrears 
input and um, as we know, ABS tends to display higher arrears relative to RMBS. So under the um, standardised approach, you know, we're really seeing credit enhancement increase quite significantly. In fact, uh, in one particular transaction, I've seen credit support increase by 18%. Um, so the, the other dynamic at play is the fact that whilst APRA um, no longer requires non-senior positions to be a capital deduction, providing that position is still extremely punitive for Australian ADIs. So um, what does this mean? You know, we are seeing some ABS warehouses become rated. Uh, but, um, you know, that, that does mean reduced flexibility um, and quite frankly, not all assets lend themselves that well to a rating. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it's the banks in those cases that are better placed to be able to assess the risk. Um, so, you know, because of the increased levels of credit support, uh, we're seeing this need for mezzanine funding. So whether it's provided by the originator or from third parties, but regardless, it's, uh, you know, ABS warehouses are far more expensive these days. Um, fortunately, the need for mezzanine funding is being met from real money investors. Uh, and an interesting theme is we're often seeing those real money investors remain in the warehouse facility and through to term refinance into the capital markets. Um, we're also seeing non-APRA regulated banks far more active in the provision of warehouse funding. Um, you know, RBC is um, certainly one of those players. Um, and this is creating more competition in the market and it's certainly reducing the reliance on warehouse funding uh, from the major banks. And Kevin, just, just finally, has APS 120 impacted the investment appetite of banks, particularly in the ABS sector? Yeah, look, I think from a, from a public markets perspective, it's a slightly different take from the warehouse sort of story that Jennifer was talking about. I think. APS 120 hasn't had a really major impact in terms of investor activity for a couple of reasons. Firstly, Australian APRA regulated banks, when they invest in public ABS deals, are typically bought in the senior AAA tranches anyway, because it's more that, that liquidity book sort of play. So the, the, the points that Jennifer was making about warehouses and sort of not attaching it subordinated tranches, that, that, that hasn't really played out in public deals. And the second dynamic is that in ABS deals, we actually see the book builds proportionally more uh, composed of real money investors relative to bank balance sheets anyway, compared to RMBS. So in that sense, you know, any changes to ABS 120 hasn't really flowed through as much uh, in ABS investment. Great. Turning up, obviously, to, to relative value considerations and we continue to see high quality auto ABS from large issuers price at or inside major bank RMBS benchmarks. Uh, and clearly investors continue to be attracted to the diversification away from residential mortgages. Jean Sebastian, how does Australian ABS fare from a relative value perspective to the other opportunities available to you in the global arena? So I, I think I would echo, you know, what was said on the previous panel here um, in the sense that we, we see value in, uh, in Australian ABS and Australian paper in general. Um, then, you know, comes the question of, from our perspective, hedging that back to US dollars where, uh, you know, uh, the current terms in the forward and, and, and cross currency markets have, have become less favorable than they may have been in the past. So obviously, you know, eroding some of that value. But uh, in the context where um, you know Australia is one of the few active securitization markets which is not totally cannibalized by QE at the moment, obviously naturally have more value there. Uh, you know that additional value also may be there for other reasons. Uh, you could call them your know, certain lack of relative liquidity, uh, a higher proportion of you know, domestic investors and so on. But um, at the margin at the moment, uh, Australia uh, remains quite attractive for us. And Jennifer, during your travels, what are some of the key themes offshore investors um, discuss about the appeal of Australian ABS? 
Yeah, so over the last few years, we've certainly seen increasing interest from offshore investors, Japanese and European investors particularly. Um, and these investors find Australian ABS particularly appealing for a number of reasons. Um, you know, the collateral is, is very high quality and it's performed extremely well. The relative scarcity of Australian ABS, particularly um, relative to uh, RMBS, uh, the shorter wells and the higher yield on the assets. Um, but also to Jean Sebastian's point, it's, um, it's the relative value proposition that Australian ABS presents to the investor. Um, and I know we heard in the previous session the comment around the fact that um, these investors are quite happy to, um, to invest in, in AUD and manage the cross-currency hedging themselves because the, um, the relative value is so compelling. And uh, just last week, Ford priced a US deal, um, the AAA two-year well tranche priced at 25 basis points. So then if you look at uh, a recent auto issuance out of Australia, Volkswagen's Driver 5 transaction, the senior AAA 1.8 year well piece priced at 93 basis points. So that translates to you know, a 50 basis point pickup for the, um, the US investor. So, so clearly the, the relative value proposition is, um, is really compelling. Um, but having said that, it's fair to say that demand has certainly been the strongest for the larger, more frequent issuers um, like Latitude and, um, and, and Volkswagen Driver. Um, and you know, we, we've really seen a significant portion of these transactions taken up by offshore investors. And probably touching on, obviously, one of the comments, John Sebastian, you made about obviously swapping back to, to USD, um, given, given your, your funding profile. Um, over the last 12 months, we've seen uh, RMBS issues in particular really tap uh, currencies outside of AUD, but we certainly haven't seen that, uh, particularly last year in the ABS sector. Kevin, is this due to AUD demand being sufficient to cover ABS transactions, or is it due to the non-AUD issuance being more expensive? Yeah, I guess it's a little bit of both. Um, I think, uh, you know, this, this theme of relative value keeps coming through that um, at the moment, you know, issuing in Aussie dollars is uh, attractive for investors on a swap-back basis and the offshore investors, um, and obviously uh, the cost for the issuers as well. It's, it's still slightly more competitive to issue in Aussie dollars at the moment. But, um, you know, in terms of volumes, um, you know, it's important, I'm sure Jean Sebastian would support this, but if you're going to look at a foreign currency tranche, you need, you know, minimum uh, tranche size to justify uh, looking at that deal and comfort on liquidity in terms of the, the, the foreign currency bonds. So, um, you know, if you've got ABS transactions, typically the deal sizes aren't as big as RMBS deals. So, um, you know, in order to sort of punch out, you know, a minimum, say, 100 million euro or sterling or whatever in tranche, that, that takes up quite a lot of the deal uh, relative to the, the pool size. So there's less pressure in ABS deals typically to look at that, that cross-currency piece. But, you know, I still think it's something that um, all the issuers look at uh, on an ongoing basis. Obviously, if the, the swap spreads change and becomes more attractive, um, ABS issuers may look to test that. And certainly, you know, the, the groundwork that the RMBS issuers are doing in foreign currencies is, is positive for ABS issuers as well because, um, you know, Euro investors are getting their head around the Australian economy, Australian collateral, regulatory risk, all those sorts of things. So that, that lays the foundations for ABS as well. We hear a lot of talk about limited liquidity in the Australian market. But early in 2018, we saw over the course of three weeks circa $2 billion of Australian RMBS and ABS uh, that was traded in the secondary market. My question to the panel, do you believe there is a secondary market in Australian ABS? And do you believe bonds can be sold at a fair market price? And perhaps maybe uh, starting with you again, Kevin. Um, I'll have a go and I'll be interested <laughs> to get John Sebastian's take on it. I mean, liquidity is a bit of a relative term. Um, so some people think, you know, true liquidity is, you know, instantaneous, you know, bid offer, you can clear the stock. 
um, whereas others look at it as long as you can clear within a reasonable time frame at or near sort of mid levels, that, that's reasonable liquidity. So it is a bit the eyes in the beholder. My experience is that the Australian market will typically clear most reasonably sized parcels within one to three business days mm. at or near sort of mid, mid levels. So that to me is reasonable liquidity. And as you mentioned, when you've got a $2 billion BWIC that got cleared, that's a lot of supply and it got digested. That, that is also a strong endor endorsement. So that, that's my take on it. And John Sebastian? So to comment on the BWIC, I think also the, the timing of that BWIC was quite favorable in the sense that you know, there was quite a lot of demand, not only for, uh, from onshore, but also from offshore investors. Quite a few dealers, um, offshore dealers getting involved as well in the asset class who may have taken that opportunity you know, to, to add on the book. So I think the timing of this was quite favorable of all, not necessarily reflective of the experience I've had with the asset class over the for the for the quarters. Um, I would say, I would echo, you know, Kevin's comment. Uh, you can achieve some liquidity within one to three uh, days, uh, but it's not immediate. I mean, obviously, sitting in Europe, you have to deal with the time uh, differential as well, which is to be factored. Uh, to be fair. Um, and uh, we also see you know, the BDAS coming a bit wider than what we see in other markets. So I would say there is some liquidity, but it's probably not like, you know, uh, quite there yet in terms of comparing to the more mature markets uh, at this point in time. And Jennifer, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, so I think it really there's two sides to the coin. Um, I don't think it's so much a case of being able to find a buyer uh, as there is, there, there just aren't many sellers. Um, you know, still the largest investor in ABS uh, is bank balance sheets and they tend to be buy and hold investors. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing to bear in mind as well that ABS does tend to repay a lot faster um, and the wells are a lot shorter. But having said that, you know, demand for ABS is very strong. Um, and I think, you know, if an investor is looking to sell their position, I'm quite confident they'll be able to do so. Uh, and finally, John Sebastian, can you readily get marks on the deals that you participate in? So um, typically, yes. Again, you know, it, it, it may be a bit of a process requiring a, a bit of fleet time. Um, but Eventually, yes, and I would say also the the, the you know the increased involvement lately uh, from uh, from new players have helped. Um, I do think, and and please don't see any offense there, but I do think the majors could you know step up their game still a little bit more there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're heading towards you know a, an improvement if you if you look back at the situation from two years ago. Great. Uh, maybe just finally turning on some recent innovations in the asset back space and clearly Latitude has issued three credit card transactions uh, via master trust structure over the last 18 months. Jennifer, do you see other Australian ABS issuers following suit and um, why have issuers, particularly in the non-bank sector, typically opted for sort of closed pool style transactions? Yeah, so really, the, the opportunity for the adoption of master trusts in the Australian ABS context is still pretty limited. Um, apart from Latitude, there have been two other examples, so Volkswagen's Driver Australia Master Trust, and um, more recently, Element established a master trust warehouse in respect of its um, Australian business. So what, what these three issuers have in common is the critical mass of their receivables portfolios um, such that they can support regular issuance um, and they're also in a position to be able to provide the necessary seller's interest in able to manage you know, any um, prepayment volatility. Uh, most other Australian ABS issuers are comparatively a lot smaller and just simply don't have the volumes required to support uh, a master trust structure. And quite frankly, to date, they've been very successful in, um, in issuing uh, closed pool single trust transactions. Um, the other thing, of course, that's stifling the development of master trusts in Australia is the fact that APS 120 is not quite sufficiently facilitative. Um, you know, I think it would make a great deal of sense for the, the major banks to establish uh, credit card master trusts. 
um, or even in the case of uh, Macquarie or Westpac, um, a, a auto uh, master trusts. Um, but alas, we're, we're just not there yet. Um, we continue to see, obviously, green bonds being issued in the panel before, talked about green RMBS uh, and certainly uh, energy efficient assets. Uh, Kevin, do you see green bonds becoming a regular feature of the ABS sector and what are the challenges structuring a, a green bond? Yeah, I think it's uh, still a bit early to tell. Um, it's, it's encouraging to see these early sort of uh, entries into the green space out of the Australian market. Um, but, uh, you know, th the challenge is you need the, the underlying collateral to be eligible for the certification for, with the, the, the Climate Bonds Initiative. Uh, so that's, that's the first challenge, is, is finding that. And then through the structuring process, getting that cert certification, um, getting investors comfortable that the, the collateral will pay down and that green element of the portfolio will stay there. So, so th those sorts of elements need to be worked through. Um, but having said that, I think it's, it, it is encouraging to see um, the developments coming. Um, you know, the, the most recent flexi uh, consumer loan deal not only had green senior tranche, but a green mes tranche. Mm -hmm. And that was very interesting. So in fact, I, you know, I think uh, they, did, they didn't offer a, a non-green mes tranche, right? It was fully green. So um, that, that's a very interesting development. It's telling you that green mandates cut across um, you know, um, capital parts of the structure um, and different sort of yield risk uh, uh, requirements. And so um, that, that, that could open up some interesting uh, pathways in the future. And John, Sebastian, does, does a green bond increase your ABS appetite or does it just sort of, you know, satisfy your ESG requirements? So I would, I would answer the question maybe starting by, by uh, mentioning the fact that as, as part of the World Bank Group, you know, um, we, we're a big supporter as a cooperator of, you know, any, uh, any endeavor to, to combat climate change and, and to support, you know, socially responsible investments. Um, so um, our own issuance is, uh, you know, pretty much uh, very active in the sector. We also support our clients to issue green bonds and so on. Having said that, on the investment uh, slash uh, you know, liquidity management side, it's not something we're fully up to speed yet. This is something we've been looking at for the past few quarters. Uh, we do screen uh, for controversy against you know, our own um, uh, restric restricted list in the United Nations rest restricted list, and excluding you know, certain issuers that don't meet uh, the required standards. Some of them are overlapping with AG standards, but. At this point in time, we are we're not really in a position to um, dedicate a mandate to ESG investments. So it doesn't really move the needle at this point in time for, for investments, but that's something we're looking at and perhaps be in a position to do a better job there in the future. Great. Well, that's about all we've got time for in terms of questions, but I might open it up to the audience if there are any questions. No? Well, please put your hands together to thank the panel for their insights. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming along today. This is a, an important element of our outreach to, to this market, which has been, has been and continues to be very supportive of, of our Australian issuers. So thank you all for coming along. Uh, to all our panellists um, and speakers and to Sam Swiss of Kanga News for coordinating, thank you for covering our agenda so well. Um, in terms of the agenda, we're likely to reach out to you to ask for feedback on what we're covering to make sure that next year when we're here again that we're, we are covering the topics that you want to hear most about to make the most of our, of our time here. Uh, and finally, thank you to Pablo and to Bloomberg for allowing us to have this in such a wonderful venue. Um, we were very lucky to get this space, so we obviously need someone to, to put this on, so thank you very much. Um, and with that, uh, I'll close it out and look forward to seeing many of you uh, in Barcelona this week. Thank you very much.